um, in the middle of the night, we climbed onto the roof of one of the Elbit factories in Shenstone, where they manufactured the engines for these drones. We spent the night up there. And the next morning with sledgehammers, we smashed all the windows in the factory. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. We begin with a protest in New Haven called against more housing theft in Palestine, specifically Silwan in Jerusalem. Word got out that more ethnic cleansing was taking place and a rushed rally was put together in front of Rosa DeLauro's office. Congresswoman DeLauro is a notorious supporter of whatever the Israeli government does. From Kashmir to Palestine. From Kashmir to Palestine. Occupation is a crime. Occupation is a crime. Hey Delora, you will see. 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 Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Oh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming out today to show your support for the people of Sudan and the people of Palestine. Uh, Rosa Delora, you should be hearing me too. I hope you got your face out the window. So we're all here in solidarity with Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah and uh, neighborhoods in Jerusalem just like the hill. Newhallville, Fairhaven, Westville, and New Haven. Israel has begun to expel Palestinian families from their neighborhood in Sheikh Jarrah. On June 29th, they leveled the uh, El Khalil butcher shop as the first, uh, the first signal that, that they're going to be uh, demolishing people's homes. The supposed, uh, the purpose for the demolition is so that they can build a biblical theme park in the neighborhood. Woo! Shame! There's more to, well, there's more to Silwan than the numbers. And there's more to Silwan than the devastation that Israel is trying to deliver to Silwan. In Silwan, it's rich with Palestinian culture and art. And I'd like to tell you about a project in Silwan called I Witness Silwan, the letter I, Witness Silwan. Uh, and let me, basically what's happened is that a bunch of artists in Silwan have painted murals all over the town, all over the neighborhood, and the eyes are looking out over the city. The director of the Madas Silwan Collective Center explains the eyes. The staring eyes say to people that we see them, and they should see us, too. We want to say that we are here, we love our land and our home. So let's tell Juan, let's tell Silwan, we see you, three times. We see Silwan! 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 We Thank you so much, Shelley. So I'm here to tell you a little bit more about Rosa's position on 2590 and why we're here today, why we're standing in front of her New Haven office. Last May, as Gaza was getting bombed by U.S. planes powered by Connecticut-made engines, some of us wrote Representative Rosa DeLauro to ask her to support HR 2590 which so far no Connecticut representative has supported. Mm. She replied that she agrees that we cannot support policies that ignore the rights of the Palestinians. She also acknowledged that the wave of violence we saw last May began with the eviction of Palestinians from their homes in Jerusalem and with the attack of the protests at Al-Aqsa Mosque. But when it comes to HR 2490, she said that she does not believe that conditioning our security assistance to our principal allies like Israel serves our national security. Shame! Shame on the Lord for this! So as someone that is Muslim, someone that is also human, 
We're not here just for Palestine as well. We're here for all oppressed people across the world. From the Uyghurs in China, to the Rohingya in Burma, to our brothers and sisters in the Congo, the forgotten people all across the world, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Colombia, in Mexico. We're here for all of them. Because we all believe in humanity. Our religion teaches us to stand for humanity no matter what. As a Muslim, I'll speak on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He always stood for humanity no matter if they were Muslim or not Muslim. And today we're doing the same thing. Because I believe in the Prophet. And I believe in his message. And I'm sure all of you guys believe in your own messages as well. Hey, Dolores! Hey, Dolores, you can't hide. You are funding apartheid. You are funding apartheid. Not another nickel, not another dime. No more money for Israel's crime. Not another nickel, not another dime. No more money for Israel's crime. Not another nickel, not another dime. No more money for Israel's crimes. No more nickel, not another dime. Now another story of Israeli government cruelty. This young Palestinian woman, Suhar Jarar, died suddenly, apparently of natural causes. Her mother, Khalida, who is a political prisoner and whose sentence is set to expire in 60 days, was not allowed to attend the funeral. Fadi Quran notes in his tweet, Want to understand apartheid? Yigal Amir, the Israeli ultra-nationalist who assassinated Prime Minister Rabin, was allowed to get married and father a child while in prison. Whereas a Palestinian mother unjustly imprisoned for her political beliefs isn't allowed to attend her daughter's funeral. <laughs> The official Israeli baseball Olympic team is touring the U.S., no doubt to pretty up Israel's bloody image. My name is Evan. I'm a local activist from Stanford. Uh, I'm here because uh, Israel uses events like uh, baseball teams and uh, other cultural events to whitewash their uh, apartheid state to make themselves seem like they're just uh, another country among countries uh, while Palestinians are being kicked out of their homes, violently oppressed, and um, the United States is funding all of it uh, with more and more money uh, all the time. John Fussell with Tree of Life Educational Fund. I uh, think it's very, very important for American people to stand up against uh, the, the ongoing failed policy of, of, of the United States in funding Israel. All that our funds have done and our, and our country's support for Israel have done is to empower a colonial, colonial settler regime that has <coughs> resulted in ongoing occupation and apartheid. Uh, the Israeli human rights organization Bethlehem has documented the apartheid regime as has uh, Human Rights Watch um, in a full 200-page uh, report. It's very interesting that we're here at uh, Dunkin' Donuts Park and they have Black Lives Matter, you know, being correct. It's near a black neighborhood. They tore up some places to make it. And, and here they host an apartheid brand. Lies, all lies. They host a country, a so-called country, that's an apartheid system where Palestinians are treated awful and killed every day and abducted every day. And I'm thinking I'm old enough to, to know about South Africa 
we used to have a sports boycott of South Africa because they wouldn't have integrated teams. They pretended everything was equal. We have a white team and a separate black team in the Bantustans. That's the situation there. All equal. It's good educated. You too. Yep. Why don't you listen to and us you and you'll get educated. People walking on the sidewalk. Thank you. Well, you know, you look at this team, if I recall, it's not just Israelis. They gave Americans some citizenships. They have them to toss out the Jewish Americans, gave them some Israeli citizenships, and now they're on this team that's going to go to the Olympics. On the topic of, of policing, you know, there's, we have police officers here. I believe they're Hartford police, um, you know, a couple of police SUVs um, guarding things, you know, supporting the Zionists walking by who are yelling things at us. Um, but we know that the, the Israeli Defense Forces actually train police departments all across this country. And I believe Hartford was one of the police departments actually that um, took part in this training. And so they travel to Israel and they come back here and, and they use what they learned on the communities that they are policing here in Connecticut and all across this country. Um, you know, we've seen um, Israeli occupation forces uh, putting, putting a knee to the necks of Palestinians, the same way that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis by Derek Chauvin. So we know that these connections are real and that they're serious and that they're important. And we're not out here for nothing. We're not out here, you know, um, for no reason. We're out here because we're witnessing massive human rights violations. We're, we're witnessing murders and uh, uh, massive, you know, injuries being affl afflicted on the Palestinian people and ultimately what amounts to an apartheid state. Um, and I just wanted to say also that, you know, um, uh, I, I converted to Islam uh, in December 2019. And as a Muslim, I know that I have to stand up against all forms of injustice and oppression. Um, not just Muslims who are being oppressed, whether it's Palestinians, Uyghurs, Rohingya, um, Kashmiris, um, Syrians, but everyone. Uh, as Muslims, I know we, we are called to stand up for all of humanity and to fight for all of humanity and to fight against injustice everywhere. And I know that the Jewish religion teaches the exact same thing. The exact same thing. Um, and so what we're seeing is um, a lot of folks coming up and, and uh, still choosing to support apartheid um, and choosing to, to support um, what Israel is doing, which is not in, in, in the name of what Judaism is actually about and what, I, what Judaism actually teaches. And so we know that to be true. Realize there are Palestinians who have been sitting in refugee camps for 70 years whom Israel won't allow back to their homeland under any circumstances. At the same time, Israel hands out citizenship to baseball players like candy to make their Israeli baseball team look good. Now the final section of my interview with Nick Georges, who climbed a 300-foot crane in London to try to bring world attention to the outrages done to Palestinians. Um, I've seen them demolish schools, schools, clinics. I've seen them demolish water wells. I've seen the army go in with JCB diggers and dig up all the water pipes to a small village of 14 families. Um, you, you mentioned the JCB, villages, is that a British firm? Yeah, and JCB is a huge British and they've got big branches in America and they make all these digger machines. Uh -huh. And they're almost exclusively, them I think in Michigan and Caterpillar, but mainly JCBs were exported exclusively to Israel to do all these demolitions for the Israeli army. They're exported illegally by JCBs. There's various UN rules and conventions which say they're not allowed to be used in illegal settlements or for legal purposes against international humanitarian laws. But still the British government won't stop them. And JCB, I've written letters to them. I've gone on protests as have many other people. JCB's wonderful British company make wonderful machines, but they just don't need to export them to Israel. 
but we've had no success whatsoever with that. And protesting is so hard. I mean, for since 1948, people have been protesting. They've been writing to their MPs. They've been doing peaceful protests. And now, 70 years later, none of it's had any effect. The Palestinians have less rights, less land. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been killed. And these peaceful protests and writing to our MPs make no difference. Mm. Our MPs, the consent, a government is supposed to rule by the consensus of its people. And the way it knows the system in England is they tell their concerns to their MPs, their MPs then voice that to government. That system does not work. It's completely inefficient. The MPs don't listen. The government doesn't listen. So what is left to us? How else can we tell the government of our concerns? And we're concerned for justice, for international humanitarian law. So the only thing that's left to us is protest. And now the government is even trying to ban us from protesting. And they're imprisoning us, not for doing bad crimes, not for killing people, not for stealing, for theft or anything bad, but because we care about injustice and suffering. And we're being imprisoned and banned because of that. Now, in terms, in terms of protest, uh, the, the media said that you had been arrested for another action, uh, I believe, on an Elbit building. Uh, what, what, what happened there? I don't want to compromise any of your legal rights, but what can you say about this? Well, basically what happened, so I got back from Palestine three years ago, and I spent three years writing, doing peaceful protests, doing everything I can, none of which makes any difference. I then heard about this protest group, Palestine Action, who do real active live protests. And through them, I heard, I didn't know about this, that this Israeli armaments manufacturing company, Elbit, has 10 factories in, on English soil manufacturing armaments. They manufacture 85% of the drones used by the Israeli army in their destruction and killing of the Palestinians in Gaza. And what was new to me was that they also manufacture white phosphorus bombs, mm. which were used in this incident, this horrific incident I saw. And once I heard about that, the people in this Palestine action said, would you like to do an action with us? And I said, yes. So along with six other activists um, in the middle of the night, we climbed onto the roof of one of the Elbit factories in Shenstone, where they manufacture the engines for these drones. We spent the night up there. And the next morning with sledgehammers, we smashed all the windows in the factory. We damaged the roof and we sprayed the whole factory with red, red paint, indicative of the red Palestinian blood that had been spilt by that factory. Now, I broke the law. I went up there and I broke some windows. But that is nothing compared to the machinery that comes out of those factory doors, the death the destruction, the suffering that comes out of those factory doors that I have witnessed with those bombs. I had no problem breaking those windows. I've never broken a window in my life. I've never been in trouble with the police in my life, but I didn't have any problem breaking the windows on that factory. And yes, I'm gonna to go to court for it soon. And my maximum possible sentence is 10 years. I don't know what's gonna happen, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. But I still believe what I did the right thing. It's, it's all about raising awareness for Palestine, the hor horrendous way that Israel is treating the Palestinians. Israel has all the power. It is the fourth biggest military nuclear power in the world. The Palestinians have nothing. They don't even have their own electricity, their own water. They may throw one or two ancient rockets about but they've got every right to defend themselves against what Israel is doing to them. Now, the, uh, I wanted to end maybe on a positive note. I mean, the rally, uh, I guess it was in London, was said to have had 180,000 people in support of Palestinians a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think that was the biggest in the world for Palestine. In America, we had a, a lot of rallies, but they were all much, much smaller. Were you part of that or were you encouraged by it? Yes, I, there was one about a week before in Whitehall where we managed to shut off the whole of Whitehall. 
and I was there for that. I couldn't unfortunately get to that one, but yes, that was hugely encouraging and a really positive. There are definite signs that despite the power of Israel crushing the Palestinians in Palestine, the power Israel has over the media, they, the minute we protest, the minute we say anything about Palestine, they completely delegitimize our voices by accusing us of anti-Semitism, completely falsely accusing us of anti-Semitism. There's nothing anti-Semitic about trying to stop what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, the fact they're breaking international humanitarian law. That is not anti-Semitic. So it's so difficult for our voices to get heard. And they make such huge efforts to crush our voices that to see 180, 190,000 people out there protesting and getting past this barrier that they crush our democracy with was really positive and really encouraging. And I think people more and more now, gradually, gradually, the world is coming to see the truth and the reality of what is actually going on in Palestine and what Israel is doing. And hopefully the more people see that, the more will our governments eventually might realise they can't keep turning a blind eye to it. My gosh, it, it was a great interview. I really appreciate you talking with me. And we'll get this out. Well, it, it was very good to talk to you, Stanley. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for letting me speak about Palestine. It, it's, it's so nice to be able to speak about it openly. And all I can say is what I've seen and what I've witnessed. And, and that's all I can say. So thank you very much, Daniel. I wish you all the best in your efforts to spread the word about what is happening in Palestine as far and wide as you can. Thank you. A new graphic and new numbers on Palestinian victims of Ruger rifles on the site no Rugers to Israel.org. Now from 350, a piece about COVID and climate change. How is climate justice linked to the COVID-19 vaccine? Just as we have seen with the climate crisis, the world's poorest and most vulnerable people are the ones who are worst affected by the pandemic. Since the onset of the pandemic, 350 has been calling for a just recovery for all. And that includes, as a priority, putting the health of people first, with no exceptions. However, we are now seeing what the World Health Organization is calling a shocking imbalance in the global distribution of vaccines between rich and poor countries. And I might add, between rich and poor citizens within some countries. If this deep inequity were to continue, it would take several years before everyone was vaccinated. And until everyone is safe, no one is safe. One way to tackle this would be to waive the patent on all vaccines. If we do that, then we can boost the global production and distribution of the vaccine. Some political leaders have started to talk about this, but frankly, we need a lot more. We need global leaders to take a real stand and put people before profit. Do we want to put the lives of people around the world first, or do we want to favour the profits for select corporations? It really is time for leaders, particularly those of industrialised nations, to take a stand and make the right decision. World leaders need to recognise the lived realities of people around the world. That is really important to us achieving climate justice, as much as it is for us to resolve the ongoing health pandemic. At 4 p.m. on Sunday, July 25th, there will be a Zoom panel talking about how land use is a big climate change factor. You may have heard the awful news that the Amazon rainforest is giving off more carbon dioxide than it is taking in. That and other issues like reforesting will be considered by the panel. It's sponsored by C3M. A link to it at pepeace.org. With thousands in the streets in Cuba, you hear American politicians from Biden to Rubio 
yakking about freedom. The Cuban government, on the other hand, says the protests are all U.S. inspired and Cuba's only problem is the sanctions. The sanctions were indeed designed by the U.S. government to cause general misery and an overthrow of the government. But there's something more going on. To find out more, read these articles on New Politics. That's newpol.org. And also read the Havana Times. Hopefully, we'll do more on this subject in the weeks to come. Syria is not much in the news today, but Assad and Putin have renewed bombing and the results are awful. These are artist renderings by Mark Nelson. These sad pictures are from the white helmets. Frederick Zuski died earlier this month. He wrote an amazing piano work, 36 variations on the people united will never be defeated. You can find it all over the internet. He did his variations on a piece that was composed by Sergio Ortega with a text written by Kala Payun in 1970. Here's a performance in 2019 in Chile during an activist upsurge. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.